Well, welcome back to Seekers of the Eternal with Pale Horse and Jason DeRosha. Chris, how are you, my brother? Hey, friends. I'm doing great. Yeah, great to be back. Good to see you again, as always. Well, Chris, I got to tell you, I'm really excited about today's podcast. I think, uh, you know, um, since you got back from the retreat and you shared a lot of those lessons and gems that you picked up, I kept thinking, of what, what's next? What's Chris going to share with us next? And um, I know that you kind of gave me a, a few little sneak peeks, um, but I'm going to turn it over to you. You know, what, where does the journey take us today? Cool. Yeah, I'd like to follow up this one in a similar fashion in talking about in the last in the last podcast we were talking about the theme of the retreat that I was at with Ananda which was uplift yourself uplift the world and then in this one I wanted to talk and go over some of the notes that I have for another talk that is about seeing daily life with uplifted consciousness so how to actually bring this into your life into your uh, day to day. And I also wanted to do something a little special in this one where we'll practice one of the guided visualizations that I really love sharing with the seekers of the eternal, like physical meditation group that we do, do together each week. So I wanted to uh, have us practice that together. And then oh. also we'll be talking about an affirmation that I like to use uh, with the group and in my practice for for invoking happiness in your life. It's like our brains are like, they're, they're, they're conditioned to let in happiness or to feel mopey and, and angry and frustrated. So with affirmations, we actually get to like become the programmers of our minds, this idea of neuroplasticity. We, we get to carve these new grooves in our mind and the old ones start to heal over and we start to really, you know, we get what we ask for. So with, medi with um, meditations and with affirmations, we start asking for happiness and we start feeling more happy. So I want to create a short meditation that will be a following episode to this. So uh, both Jay, you could practice this each uh, each day during the week, and all the listeners could do the same and kind of report back on on how it went. That way, we have a little bit of an experiential session. Awesome. Here. Yeah, that would be cool. You know, one of the things I think I struggle with, I'm sure a lot of people struggle with, is you know, you 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 start the day and you're like, okay, this is going to be the day. I'm going to feel positive. I'm going to remain optimistic. I'm going to be productive. I'm going to get to all those to-do lists that have been procrastinating. And then all of a sudden things happen in the environment with your spouse, with your kids, with your job and the traffic, with your bills. And all of a sudden, all of those positive thoughts right out of the window. Yeah. And so how do you, you know, how, you know, one of the things that I always struggle with is how do you maintain that that balance throughout the day and then almost remember you know what you what you said your mission was as soon as you got up and out of bed so I, i'm really looking forward to, to to this podcast today yeah that's what i think it's like we can talk about this all day long but then like putting it really into action is what i'm interested in We're yeah those like uh, martial artists you know like create a discipline like, this is what i'm doing what else would you rather be doing than than training your mind to feel happy to to you know so that's what we all want we're trying to find it in all these different ways that don't work that don't yeah. actually bring happiness so this is a way that we can strive seek after that which actually brings us happiness so i also wanted to start with um, this is this is one of my favorite teachers at ananda her name is naya swami asha she's just incredible and and so I also want to like in this in this podcast and in the meditation I use the word God and I think that tripped me up for so long so I know it trips everybody else up because in the English language that word really has no meaning and it probably just conjures up a lot of negativity that uh, a lot of us have around that word so I yeah. wanted to just play this like really just in her own words I'm just going to like put the speaker up to the microphone so you can hear her oh. this this is um this is really the only good word for God which is in Sanskrit so I'm gonna I'm gonna play that so we can just and her name one more time before you play it 
What's her name, her name one more time before you play? This is, this is Naya Swami Asha, and she's got a, a really great Instagram account, which is inner life with underscore Asha. Okay. And so she shares things like this on there daily. So I'm just going to play this really quick. Okay, so this is Naya Swami Asha's only good word for God. Good word for God that I know of is in Sanskrit. Sat Chid Ananda ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new bliss. The word God otherwise in English is a very confusing word because it actually means nothing unless you have some kind of a theology or a series of beliefs that will define it for you. Other words in Sanskrit that are also synonyms for God, ananda, it means bliss. Shanti, it means peace. Prem, it means love. Now, Ananda, Shanti, Prem do not mean love like, oh, I had croissants for breakfast and I just love them. It's not sense-oriented sense affection or selfishly directed love. It means infinite, unconditioned, eternal love. And bliss is the same. That uh, experience of the inner state of unconditioned joy. So when people say, I don't believe in God, Usually I ask them, what God do you not believe in? Because the God that they don't believe in is usually the God I don't believe in either because it, it doesn't satisfy my thinking mind or my yearning heart rather than believers or non-believers. We have to be truth seekers and we have to quest ever more deeply for an understanding of life that brings us to a state of such as Ananda. What are your, when you first heard that, why did that, why did that stand out for you? It, because it, um, it goes beyond a sort of intellectual thinking about something that can't be, it can only be sort of hinted at. You can't really, so when we, when we try to define the word God, it's something that you can't really talk about, but what, but we all are hopefully, maybe not all of us have, experience a sensation of joy or bliss mm. at least at some point in our life as fleeting as it might be we could we we can understand that or even you know just we can understand that feeling and um and that is what god truly is so we can we can have a uh, we can have a taste of that you know I, I find it, that's why I like uh, working with plant medicines because they allow me to feel and taste bliss. Mm. I can feel bliss in something that I really love doing, you know, in, in say like something like surfing or being out in nature or being a, um, having a really uh, uh, close person that you are spending time with and enjoying that time together, going beyond but even those have a object and something that you're, you know, associating that feeling with, with, with God, it's just that feeling only. And there's no, there's no, uh, there's no uh, limits to it. And there's, there's no uh, end to it or, yeah. So it, it helps us to get a better sense of, of what God really is and what we're aiming at, which is, really God contact and self-realization. And if we realize the self, we realize what we really are. We actually realize that we are God. Mm. We are that feeling of bliss and that everything in this universe is a manifestation of that bliss. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it, it's a break from the traditional maybe not entirely, I'm sure if someone talked about God in the traditional sense, maybe like in the religious sense, uh, they may they may also say that that's how they experience God. But I think what, what stood out to me, it was, it's not, it wasn't a definition of God, it was more uh, God is an experience and, and a feeling like you, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it. It's not to know, it's to experience and it's to feel. And I thought that that's how it spoke. That's, you know, the first time I've ever really you know, thought about uh, God like that, um, which I feel very interesting because I think when people, and even like know, like to know, Socrates says, you know, you, you, we know nothing. The only thing I know is that I know nothing. Um, and I think 
that might be where people start to get lost on religion and God, right? It's this, it's this, it's this thirst to know, because then if I know, then that means I'm right and you're wrong or you're wrong and I'm right. You know, Mm -hmm. like, um, it's a, it's a weird kind of game to play. Um, when you get into this thing, who who knows for sure. But I think in terms of experience, if, if everybody gets to a space where they feel like I've experienced God, then, you know, there's no longer an argument. We either have experienced it and you feel it or you, or you, or you, or you don't. Mm-hmm. And it's completely universal. And no it becomes universal. Yeah. That's right. No matter what path you take to get there. Yeah. That's what we're all aiming That's cool. At. That's really cool. Yeah. Wow. So I feel like that sort of dispels the, that anxiety that we have. I think a lot of times when in the West, when we think about God, we have this sort of, old testament uh judge kind of a Mm. idea and we feel like when we approach god we just feel a sense of guilt and shame about not being who we want to be or that we're going to be somehow judged but that's not at all what god is god's not judging us we we can think of god even as yogananda often says that the easiest way to approach god is to become like a child and to see God as our mother, that, you know, a a really great mother who always is happy that that her kids are coming to be with her. Even if you're the worst child in the world, your mom still is happy that you're here and asking for uh, her love and her attention and that sort of a thing. So, Yeah. yeah. That's super interesting. The other thing that I thought of that hearing her, thank you for sharing that. Chris, that, that was, um, like I said, it was a kind of an eye opener for me. One of the other things I thought while I heard that explanation was, you know, sometimes there's like a guilt associated with, oh, so, you know, you feel God and if, you, if you're defining the experience uh, and feeling as joy and bliss, I think that it's hard for, I mean, I'll speak for myself, but it's hard for me to always have access like give myself permission to access God because there's certain scenarios and situations where you feel like I shouldn't be feeling bliss right now. And I shouldn't be feeling joy. Maybe because you've hurt someone, maybe because someone else is hurt, maybe because you're going through a tough time and almost you, you prevent yourself from accessing God. If, if God is this experience, if God is this bliss and joy, you can sometimes shame yourself into not allowing God into your life. If you, you know, you define, if you define that, experience of God is joy or bliss. So Mm -hmm. how do you, so I guess this is kind of getting into the heart of it, um, which is, you know, how do you access this all day, every day? And even sometimes, you know, you're frustrated or you're mad or you're upset and you don't even want to access that feeling of bliss and joy or or God as as we've just heard it. Um, So how do we get there, Chris? How do you, how do you uplift yourself in a way that allows you to always access the infinite? Yeah, I'm glad you articulated that because I'm sure a lot of other people feel that and so do I as well as as we start to practice these things, all these little pitfalls that come up and the, you know, from my experience and from the teachings that I've tuned into that this, we can train our minds to, to uh, receive the bliss and the love that is always flowing to us. And, um, I was going to bring up, a, a, but this is a good time to talk about it now. Swami Kriyananda said the description of his the description of love is bliss in motion. So if you can think about you experiencing bliss and then sharing that bliss with somebody else. And in our meditation practice, and what, what I'll actually be working into the meditation practice that I share after this episode will be that we learn to feel and experience that bliss. And then we, in our minds, we, we bring our loved ones. We can even bring our enemies. We can bring in people that you're feeling guilty about. Maybe you said the wrong thing to, or any of those things that's, that are pitfalls for us. We feel that we, we feel that love within us so that we can share it with others. And then also when we go out into the world, we can become a vibration that is sharing that love with others. So it's not a selfish thing. And it is actually the best thing that we can do is to feel 
love and bliss in in difficult times so that we can be a beacon that actually helps others and in the way that my relationship with uh, god as the divine mother i feel that what she actually wants from me that makes her most happy is if i'm enjoying my life as much as i possibly can that's what does a mother want for her child she doesn't that's want true. you to mope around feeling guilty about everything she, she wants you just to uh, move on from that and enjoy your life and do better the next time so yeah. I think that's only it's only us like we were talking about last week was about sort of the being our own prison guard where we're the only one punishing ourselves and keeping ourselves from feeling this love and joy that is available we're judging ourselves so I think that keeps yeah. us from yeah feeling it and also from sharing it and helping others so yeah, I love that. I think, yeah, you're right. Like, just think about how you can connect and share with others. It, 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 it's, it's, you know, that shame and that guilt maybe comes from because, you know, you start to approach it as very individualistic. You start thinking about yourself and that maybe I shouldn't do this. But if you think of getting, giving yourself permission to access that bliss and that joy, because it allows you to then share it with somebody else. You know, I think of my kids, of course, um, the love that I have for my kids, that that's bliss. That's complete joy um and uh and happiness you know and love in general like we all know we for those of us i mean like i think you said you used to be an atheist at one point and um you know i've had tr trouble i've spoken to many people who are atheists and um you know and i've probably even you know entertained the thought as well but i think the the thing that i always kind of come back to is like love even the atheist experiences love you can't feel it. You sorry, you can't see it. It's not behind a door. It's very hard to define, but we know it's there. You know, we know that we we feel love. We feel love for our child. We feel love for our parents as a, as a child. You feel love for your parents if they love you. Um, you know, so my definition of of God is love. You know, that's how I would define it to my to my kids. You know, you can't you can't really you can't know love you can feel it and then maybe by feeling it you can try to explain it i've heard people try to articulate what love is and they do a much better job than i but i do think that you can feel it in the way that you know um we've just heard god be defined so mm -hmm. so that's kind of interesting like you you share it with somebody else and that's the true that's that's how you you get to carry it with you there's no shame um because you now get to pass that on that's good Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd like to sort of just continue illuminating this. Uh, yeah, this is please. a this is an email that I got from another um, Ananda teacher. Her name is Gayatri uh, Gayatri Register, and I'd like to just go through these points that she sent in the email. We can sort of discuss them kind of briefly and go through yeah. it because I, I do also have a lot of great notes from the um, the spiritual renewal week Wonderful. as well that I'll go through. So okay. This will this will open us up to uh, after this we'll do the actual joy visualization together and we'll Sounds practice good. like right now like actually feeling love and joy. Okay. And so, yeah. So okay. So she says, joy is within us, and when we can remain joyful regardless of outer circumstances, we are affirming our divinity our eternal nature. Yogananda taught that circumstances are always neutral, but it is our response to them that gives that color that, oh, sorry, but it is our responses to them that color our life. We can choose somber colors, or we can see the world filled with light, beauty, and golden joy. Ours is the choice, each day, each moment, right now. Just like a mirror, the attitude we choose will be reflected back to us. Mm. So like what you were talking about earlier, is we, this is what we want to remind ourselves of over and over and making a daily practice in the morning to just rekindle, restoke that fire. Yeah. And then the more and more we do it, then the more our brain starts naturally wanting to go in this direction. It takes time to, we, we've probably had however many 
maybe millions of lifetimes not doing this you know, True. and d- just digging even if you just think about this one lifetime how often do we just we side with feeling negative or we read things that upset us in the news and then we just go into a negative and we see the world as negative and every yeah. interaction is painted with negativity and so it's like about breaking free from that with a discipline it's not like this airy fairy thing like you right. actually have to put in a lot of work to to do it but what you're but the work that you're doing it, you do it with a with with joy so you immediately yeah you know, it's it's just about joy all around so yogananda says from joy i came for, uh, uh, uh what is how does it go um from joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I melt. Mm. So we, we left joy to come here on earth to live in joy, to enjoy this, this wonder, this infinite possibilities, virtual reality video game. And then when we dissolve again, we'll dissolve back into joy. So we just have forgotten. So I, I, you know, I'm being w- awakened, woken up to this and I, I like to just be able to feel that joy in myself every day and I know that's you know you're doing the same thing is is spreading joy with others through uh, the books that you write and with the kids that you work with and with your with your own kids so it's just about like daily like stoking that and reminding it and then just making it stronger and stronger so yeah it's like we it's a choice it's a choice each day each moment right now just like a mirror the attitude we choose will be reflected back to us and I love what you said there, Chris, about it doesn't just all happen just as what once and then you're like, ta-da, got it, mm-hmm. got it for nine to five. It's like you inch by inch almost. You you and you, the more you do it, you know, today maybe you'll get 10 minutes of joy, and then tomorrow maybe it's 20, and then maybe an hour. But you have to, you need to almost um make like you said, make this part of your daily habit and every day it grows, you get better and better at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was so easy when I was at the Nanda retreat, though, I was just walking around grinning the whole, like, (laughs) like, legitimately just feeling the vibration of all of those just great souls and that environment and being out in nature. There's, it's times where it's much easier, you know, so do things for ourselves that make it easier on ourselves. Like, what is, what is healing for us? You know, everybody kind of, either we know it, uh, or we actually don't know what's like, so these these tools that we're we're um, talking about now will, will give us a way to do that. Or if you have things that you know, environments that you can be in that make it easier. If you can take some time away from your your daily grind, mm. if you can make a special like place part like closet. I can I'm sitting behind my little meditation closet where I go in there and I shut the door, and that's the place where I feel joy every day. So wow. it's like closing you know closing in the outside world can be just any little corner of your room you know get a little divider i put on headphones like just you know ear protective headphones and just turn off the whole movie and just go in there and you know so it conditions us over time to all right when i go in here i feel joy (laughs) yeah well you uh, i guess one day maybe not on this podcast but would you mind maybe showing us your meditation room and that's taking us through your practice with you because i think that's you know it's one thing to tell people you meditate but it's another thing to kind of see how you meditate so you know i mean not not have the camera in there the entire time but meaning like this is just kind of like just like here i'm just showing you around my meditations practice yeah yeah i could show you yeah Yeah, that'd be really cool just like set up of just like things that are useful to me like i put on the altar things that i'm trying to overcome I put on the altar and pictures that remind me of uh, my teachers and all of that kind of stuff so yeah creating a little space like that for yourself it's really powerful that's really cool Uh, so the next line here is so how do we consciously attain, attain the state of contentment We can affirm and direct our will to foster a feeling of contentment, regardless of our outer circumstances. Begin by remaining calm and joyful during lesser tests so that you will have the strength to practice contentment during greater trials. Swami Kriyananda wrote, 
Happiness is not a brilliant climax to years of grim struggle and anxiety. It is a long succession of little decisions simply to be happy in the moment. Be grateful for everything, especially the little things. So in this way, we're yeah. learning to consciously attain the state of contentment. Begin by remaining calm and joyful during the lesser tests so that you will have the strength to practice contentment during greater trials. Mm. That's really and this, and, You know, Swami Kriyananda, as you know, he says, happiness is not a brilliant climax to years of grim struggle and anxiety. You know, don't go in, don't, don't practice trying to be joyful with grim anxiety <laughs> and struggle. So you go in with a sense of joy. Like if you're aiming at joy, if you're, if you're meditating on joy, you go in with joy, start with joy. Yeah. And we actually can make that decision to be happy in the moment. Yeah. And that kind of just goes back to what we were saying before, like just do it in times where it's easier for you. If you really, and then also when it's not easy, do it anyway, but do it in the times where it's, it's, it's a, when you can't, like, it's a, it's a peaceful, yeah, you know, you can, you can set aside a, if for meditating or for practicing these things, like in the morning, as soon as you wake up is a great time. They say also noon is, is sort of a liminal time in the day or sort of that's where we sort of break for lunch and you know the world is a little more calm and then also at twilight when the sunset is another uh, more calm time during the day and if you just you know make sure you just turn off your phone and turn off everything and just tell people that need to know like oh, i'm going to be you would think you could break away for 20 30 minutes and it would the world isn't going to explode on you but when you first start doing that it's so strange like even 20 minutes of turning off the big movie <laughs> feels like you're you oh i gotta be doing something but right. how often do we just mess around for 20 minutes all doing the time yeah <laughs> youtube and tiktok and instagram like all these social media channels like they can suck you in just by scrolling through the feed you know i'm sure everyone's kind of had that experience so and then, you know, just other things like we've, we used to, before all social media, we used to get stuck in front of the, 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 the boob tube, the TV, and then you would just sit there and get sucked into, you know, whatever it is, the show, whatever show that was. And there goes one, two, three hours of your life, sometimes more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. I think everybody has the opportunity to do it. It's just being disciplined enough. And I think the other thing that goes with it is you have to see it as kind of give it as a gift to yourself. Like, like you're rewarding yourself. It's not, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, I'd, I'd rather just turn everything off and, and go watch a, watch a movie or go on social media because it, it's, it's like, um, it almost like it shuts, you know, your consciousness shuts up and everything else is just like, you just passive, everything just, you just get fed, but meditation is an act, right? Like it, even though it's a peaceful act, it's like, it is a concerted effort to try and quiet the mind and focus and give yourself a break from everything. And it can be very overwhelming and anxiety producing, um, just thinking about sitting down to do it. But I think if, you know, like you said, perspective matters, if you go at it, like this is a gift I'm about to bestow on myself and then really focus as you just suggested, I think mm -hmm. we all have this chance to experience it in a, in a, in a miraculous way. And even if you can just get like, moment of no thought it, like just a, a little moment of no thought mm. it feels incredible because you, you just like because even when you're watching tv you're caught up in some other drama or something else that's getting you agitated or whatever is happening and then afterwards you don't really feel that good after you sat down no matter how good the tv show or whatever it is you still have this feeling of like, I just sort of wasted some time. Yeah. I mean, really good, really good. Like there's some really good TV out there. So I won't say all of it, but you can get some really great, great inspiration from anything. But, but most of the time after you're done watching a bunch of TV, it's not like you feel really good. It's, right. you know, we talked about before. I love the Yogananda. He calls like these, these pleasures, these things that they, they're poison honey. 
they they're mm. charming and they, they taste good but they'll kill you so at first yes. you think like this thing is <laughs> is good is going to be good and you'll enjoy it but in the in the end you, you you leave and you don't feel any better afterwards it didn't really create any real lasting joy but but a single moment of 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 a quiet mind and an open heart your your mind becomes healed in in ways that you can't even understand just from how it's so rare that we have a, a moment just if even if like right now like if you just take let's say five seconds and just close your eyes and mm -hmm. just you know uh, and and just calm the calm the mind open the heart five seconds just sign listen so gaze uplifted at the point between the eyebrows listen and feel in the heart for five seconds ready go That's it. You know, it yeah. just like, oh, it feels good. It does. Do <laughs> it's so peaceful. It's like, yeah, it's almost like you're accessing a different dimension, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, it's so rare. Like this dimension is not allowed here, you know, like traffic's going by, kids, job, responsibilities, like, you know, to actually quiet the mind and shut everything down. Oh, and then phones, social media, um, mm -hmm. who, who's liked my post, like, I think, um, you know, get, going to that quiet space feels so foreign now, but feels so great when you allow yourself the chance to go. Mm -hmm. You go beyond time and space when you're, when you're, your thinking mind is quiet. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's infinite, uh, it's infinite possibilities that exist there. Yeah. So um, in this, um, so moving through this, uh, this note here, uh, so she says, be grateful for everything, especially the little things. In our meditations, if instead of waiting for a feeling of joy to come to us, we meditate with joy and peace, we will attune ourselves to our true nature. Then we can say joyfully through, <laughs> through life's mightiest storms, I am contented, for I hold in my heart God's peace. I'll read that again. Through life's mightiest storms, I am contented, for I hold in my heart God's peace. And we can learn to feel that peace in the quiet times. And then if we practice, 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 we create these new great we grooves in our mind, we train ourselves. And when the storms do come in life, we can tune into that same peace, that same calmness, even if we're not in a peaceful world or there's yeah. not, it's not peaceful things happening to us the, the great saints and the, our heroes that we you know are great people uh, that are doing incredible things they even though really challenging things are happening inwardly they can remain calm and uh, so that's that's a really valuable real practical reason to do this and if i can say one thing just yeah. to add to that uh, mm -hmm. chris i think sometimes <clears throat> we invite the chaos and the storms into our lives as well and the way out of it you know you know that you have to take some kind of action like you have to you either have to focus you have to work you have to put in the time we have to put in the effort but because that storm and that chaos has come in um, and you know you have to put in the work sometimes you you for you think well if i go in and meditate now or just give myself some peace I'm just procrastinating that thing further. And I think from what I just heard you say, I don't see that at all. I think that the procrastination comes because you know you have to put in the work. Yes, you may have created the storm and you have to put in the work to get that done. But I think until you give yourself the chance to just stop, meditate, calm, breathe, and then give yourself the clarity to focus on the next step, you, you end up procrastinating and never getting done. And then the storm mm -hmm. gets worse and the chaos gets worse and you get deeper and deeper until sitting down quietly by yourself for five minutes to compose yourself does feel like a monumental task. And so I think, like I said, I, I really hope that people start to see meditation and giving yourself a chance to access the infinite or the joy or the bliss um, as, a, as a way out of the storm, as a way out of the chaos, because you're preparing yourself for that for that battle, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have, if we have the fear and the self-judgment and all the things that go with uh, whatever, you know, 
whatever failure that we have or misunderstanding from others or anything that, that we're dealing with, if we're in that state of mind, we're going to cut corners. We're going to make yeah. bad decisions. We're going to do things that are not actually helpful. But if we do seemingly the opposite thing that it seems like you should do is take a minute, take a break, breathe, focus, do so, you know, use a breathing technique, use this meditation that we'll post here and find your center again. And they say, Swami Kriyananda, if I can get this right, he, he said that intuition is calm feeling. They are synonymous, calm feeling, agitated feeling blocks intuition. Mm. So calm feeling is intuition. It's the same thing. So when we are in this calm feeling, it's like it's like a Jedi using the force. Whenever you see Jedi practicing, it's that calm feeling. And then all of a sudden, you know what to do. You may just have a spark of insight flash into your mind. Okay, I know what to do. I know what to do, right? And then and then you go out and you do the exact thing that you should do or before you maybe would have spun your wheels and made it worse, you know? So this is very practical for yeah. if you want to be a Jedi. <laughs> cool, nice. it's a good, uh, good analogy. Mm -hmm. to, to, we have to become masters of, of both the physical world and the, this, you know, the, uh, uh, the metaphysical world. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, just, she just ends this with, let us aspire to consciously see the golden beauty of life's circumstances, however they may come to us, and abide always in contentment. So being content with whatever comes, knowing that it's, you know, just before this podcast, you know, you, there's things that come up, like you were fighting with your refrigerator that just <laughs> That's broke, right. or you had to like do these things, or, you know, things happen that, uh, can stress us out but if we just see you know as you called me oh I, I, there's these things that I'm going through I have to, have to come on a little bit later I was like oh okay cool that gives me a little more time to uh, read over my notes or to mm. whatever so rather than you know me getting agitated or something like that I always try to see it as like oh this thing's coming for me okay cool uh, and then in the same way, you know, you're just, okay, well, this, this is happening with some electronics that's failing. It's like not a bad thing. It's like something that I can't see. It's doing this for me. So if I yeah. just stay calm and I just do what I have to do and move through it, even if I don't realize in the moment why it happened, it is happening for, for me and not against me. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I think I love the fact that you're able to, you know, and again, this comes from the fact that you really thought about this and put in the practice and the discipline. I think I still fail at that sometimes, you know, like well, literally. I'm, sorry? <laughs> yeah, me too. I said, of course, me too. You know, okay. like I, I'm practicing this. It, it's coming more naturally, but. Yeah. I, as soon as I got home, I, my daughter had baseball today. And as soon as I got home, I, the, the, I could hear my fridge just like going, going, going. I was like, oh no, not now. Cause it's a, I gotta pull out everything. And so the stress level goes from like zero to 10. And um, now you think back, cause I'm thinking, oh my God, I gotta still have to get my kids to bed and I have to jump on the podcast and get ready and then prepare myself mentally. And, but then you, you know, all of that worrying didn't help me at all. This, I still had to fix the fridge. I still have to get my kids to bed. I still have to jump on the podcast. And um, I feel great. Thankfully that my daughter is sleeping and the fridge is fine and this podcast is going great. Uh, but it's just in the moment I allow myself to get, you know, just take my, my mind to go into the, to the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And that's what happens. Like just because we're so used to going, doing that, used to getting stressed about things, then our brain goes, Oh, well, it's always been like this. So he wants it to be like that in the future. So it's just trying to, it does whatever we tell it to do. So with affirmations, we start telling it to do something else. So like we, like before we were talking about overriding, you know, like overriding previous subconscious thought patterns of fear and gloom and allowing your soul to receive that joy that is always flowing to you you know it's like it just it, he, oh of course he, he wants to be upset and, and, and fearful and all that so run that 
subconscious thought pattern. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah that's right. Used to doing that. So it's going to be like, yeah, of course he wants that again. <laughs> yeah, you got to reprogram yourself. It's, uh, and it's a worthwhile task. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I thought from here would be a good place to jump into. We can really do this, this affirmation. This is, well, this is a visualization that we'll do together. This is one that I like to open up our meditations with sometimes. I know I'm also going to do something that might feel a little strange, which is this is opening with a prayer, uh, but Yogananda, he doesn't really call them prayers. He calls them sacred demands to the infinite. Mm. <laughs> All right. Because it is our will. It's our will plus, you know, our willpower times energy. And what do we really want? What are we really asking for? We're like making demands. He says, don't come to God like a beggar. We're not beggars. You're a child of God. You, your, your, your father is the, is the, uh, he's like the ruler of the universe. You mm. are, you know, you, you have this, this birthright. So don't come as a beggar, demand what you want to happen. And, and that will, it will come faster to you. Wow. So as we think of this as a prayer, we are actually, we're actually with our, consciousness we're, we're demanding something that is actually really good for our soul and god likes it when you come that way <laughs> okay yeah so yeah so we can begin like wherever you are just sitting up straight in your chair if you're sitting in a chair with a back you can sort of just like come away from the back of the chair a little bit and just sit with your spine in a straight line head parallel to the floor and you can keep your gaze uplifted at the point between the eyebrows. It's really, you could imagine a distant mountain range and just seeing uh, at the top of that mountain range, that's about where the spiritual eye is. And if you notice when you're keeping your gaze focused there, you feel, you feel a sense of upliftment and energy moving upwards. So you can say this, I'll say, the this prayer I'll, I'll say the first line and then if you could repeat it back to me so with the palms together in front of the heart we'll say this prayer together so repeat after me oh spirit oh spirit teach me to enjoy thee in spirit teach me to enjoy thee in spirit that i may enjoy the world and my earthly duties with joy that i may enjoy the world and my earthly duty duties with joy O oh Spirit, O oh Spirit, help me to train my senses. Help me to train my senses. That they enjoy only good things. That they enjoy only good things. Teach me to enjoy earthly pleasures with thy joy. One more time. Teach me to enjoy earthly pleasures with thy joy. Teach me to enjoy earthly pleasures with thy joy. Save me above all. Save me above all. From the slight of touch, from the slightest touch, from the slightest touch of negativity, doubt, and cynicism. Negativity, doubt, and cynicism. Om peace. Amen. Om peace. Amen. So let's quickly we're, we'll be discharging and, and releasing the tension in the body. So let's take in a deep double inhalation. It sounds like this. And then we'll tense, low, medium, high, all the muscles in the body. And then exhale, relax. Again, inhale and tense. Low, medium, high, vibrate all of the muscles in the body. Exhale, relax. Feel. Again, inhale and tense. Low, medium, high, vibrate with energy. Exhale, relax. Feel, release all the tension. And now begin to recall a moment in your life where you can remember special joy, perhaps a time when you were in nature or where you felt closest to another human being. Take a minute now and recall that memory. Now, remove from that moment all sense of excitement or restlessness.
then remove from it also all sense of cause. Don't associate with what was happening at the time. Let your memory of joy exist as a pure reality in itself. Feel that joy in its pure essence. And hold on to that feeling and let it fill your whole being. Consciously allow yourself to feel joyful and free. And feel a smile spreading across your heart. Feel a smile spreading across your throat. Feel a smile spreading across your mouth. And feel a smile spreading across your brow. Om, peace, amen. So with this simple practice, we can feel more and more, and the more that we get practice with recalling these joyful moments in our life, and then taking away the association with what was happening at the time, you'll notice the more you do it, that there is, when you recall the, the moments that you're in, there's like a, still a, a level of restlessness or excitement that actually dulls the feeling of pure joy. So with this practice, we learn to feel that pure joy and its pure essence without a body, you know, without our moods. Or so this is a it's a wonderful practice. And then I find myself after using this more and more that I go around in life like trying to record new ones, you know, like yeah. okay, oh I'm out in nature. Oh here's a new one. I feel it, record it, you know, take it in or you with somebody and you're having like a really special nice time with them and you're like yeah okay this would be a good one to revisit later yogananda said something that i really love he says uh, this is just paraphrasing but he would say that um it, our memories are are a gift it's a blessing we we're, we're we've given these memories as a as a blessing so that we can recall good things and it's a misuse of our memory to recall negative things that upset us. We're not mm. supposed to use our memory for that. We can use our memory for introspection, of course, and going back and like, okay, um, I see where I did something that I wish I would have done better there. But beyond that, it's it, we're not supposed to recall negative things with our mind. We're misusing this gift. So we're right. supposed to use our memories to re recall good things so it's a permission to do that for everybody <laughs> oh that, that's good i love that you know you think of getting when you're driving and uh, you get cut off or something doesn't you know happen or you're the way that you expected or wanted it to or someone says something that you know it hurt that hurts it's like an insult and um you can store that and, and knock out so many good memories, you know, because mm -hmm. I guess it all takes up space. So, you know, so in that moment, how do you avoid storing it? Is it just by, is it just by changing your perspective? Is it just by making the decision to let, let go of whatever you just experienced? How do you make sure that that doesn't become something that you, you carry with you? Yeah, I think it's just over and over repetition, over and over, like doing mm. my practice, doing it. I do, you know, I have a meditation in the morning and I have one at night and I try to keep the, uh, keep reminding myself all day. I didn't start out that way, obviously, like yeah. I started out very small and, um, but, you know, but making it, making a daily practice, daily reminding, you use these affirmations, it will start to come up and, oh yeah, right. I was supposed to stop that. So I guess the first thing is, it's, it's kind of like every day, you know, walking outside your door and falling into a hole, you know, like eventually yeah. you'll go around it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just a, it's just a repetitive unconscious pattern that says like, 
you should get upset. Like my brother and I, Matt, we talk about this quite a bit, like driving is a good one because say someone you're driving down the freeway and somebody cuts you off and makes you swerve and, and slow down or whatever. Mm. You know, we like to look at it as like that person, I just had to swerve and slow down. Maybe maybe them doing that saved me from getting into an accident up the, up the street somewhere. Maybe that was actually an angel helping me or this was mm. just something that was... It was good. So you don't know what, if it was good or bad. So just look at it as good. Like why, why choose to like, think that was a negative thing. You don't know if it's yeah. negative or positive. That's interesting. Yeah. Can you imagine that getting cut off and you're like, thank you. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's so much more, fun. it's so much nicer. of a feeling Yeah. Yeah. Guys. It's like, you just get used to like, you know, it's like this idea of, uh, I don't know if it's Yogananda, but he talks about it. I don't know if he got it from somewhere else too, but they say that um, once you get used to eating fresh cheese, you no longer want to eat stale cheese. And this is a weird one. It's like a strange thing, but it really sort of clicked in my mind after mm. years of hearing this. It was like that feeling that you get about like getting mad at somebody that cut you off. It's like eating stale cheese. like you didn't know that there was like a better feeling emotion, something that you could have had. So if you actually, somebody cuts you off and immediately you go into like a gratitude uh, mindset, like that's, Oh, well, fresh cheese. Like it's so great. I didn't even know that's that cool. it could be like this, you know, and yeah. you don't want that. And you're just like gross. I don't want to feel like that. I don't want to eat that gross stale cheese yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah. I feel like as you get older, you get better at not getting too, um emotionally engaged in these kinds of like you can tell when someone's trying to goat you a bit and and get you to go to that dark place and i've seen people like masterfully just avoid chaos and i'm thinking to myself if that was me i'd just lose it and you know um mike tyson actually has become a quite quite the philosopher uh in his you know chapter two of his of his life and he was talking to a young guy and the young guy was talking to him about, you know, if someone ever, you know, was disloyal to me, I'd cut them off. And Michael and Mike Tyson says, you know, what you're suggesting is not the answer. And he's like, what are you talking about? If someone's disloyal to you, you think you should give them a chance? And he says, yeah, he's like, it's not about giving them a chance, but um, if you allow someone to dictate your, your actions, they become your master, you know? So if they hurt you and that, changes how you you know who you are if you're a good person but it changes who you are you become less thoughtful or spiteful or inconsiderate or more unkind then you're giving up the, your control your self-control you're giving it to somebody else you know you have mm -hmm. to don't make someone else your master especially someone who you consider to be your enemy or someone who hurts you uh you know, then don't give up control to that person stay within the person that you are and i just thought that was kind of interesting he didn't, he didn't use all yeah. of those words i kind of added some but sure. but i think that was the essence of what it is that he was trying to say and if mike tyson can do it there's hope for all of us you know yeah. like he was definitely training his mind to not be doing that so that's right he can do it like man anybody can so, so true that's so, a lot so of hope true. for us yeah. <laughs> yeah that was such a good meditation uh, practice that you just did with me, Chris. I'm so glad we catch this on, on the podcast because I'm going to go back and do it again. Uh, cool. I yeah, feel and I'll make that into like a, a, like a, a little 20 minute um, one that you can just tune into every morning this week, you know? Yeah, that would be, um, the community is going to love that. That would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that'll, that'll be really cool. So do, should we, uh, do we have time to go through kind of, I've got uh, notes on this other talk to kind of wrap up our uh, yeah, please, please. I'll just, uh, I'll listen, just uh, take us through it. Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I like these, I, I can, you know, say these, and then I like to hear your how they how they resonate with sure. you and move through them a, a little quicker. And um, so this is notes from one of my teachers at Ananda named Naya Swami Narayan. And this is from the, the um, spiritual renewal week that I was at at Ananda the retreat recently. And so this is about seeing daily life with uplifted consciousness. So in our last podcast, it was about uplift yourself, uplift the world. So this continues with that theme about doing this in your daily life. So it plays into all the things that we've been talking about here. So he was starting with the, the talk with using this acronym of SMILE, S-M-I-L-E. And to begin, it was really just S is for SMILE. 
uh, an interesting, it was, it was really cool. Like one of the first meditations that we did at a, at a, at spiritual renewal week, they, after the meditation, they'll just read a little, um, little excerpt to like get your mind in the right place. I can't remember what book this was from, but after the, after the morning meditation, the, the, the host read from Swami Kriyananda, he said, if you want to enjoy life, take yourself less seriously. And then also Swami Kriyananda said, be the first to smile. When you meet someone, greet them from your heart. Feel that from your center to their center. Try to meet them in that way. So Swami Kriyananda, he would just say, be the first to smile. You know, and then mm. Narayan was following up with, when you meet someone, greet them from your heart and feel that from your center to their center. Try to meet them in that way. So if we can always, you know, if we remember this acronym, just first, like, be the first one to smile at somebody and then really, like, greet them, greet them from the heart. I remember when I first started doing this a bunch of years ago, it was so strange. Like, I was totally not a person that would do that. Like, I was, I had a pretty, I don't know, like, I just was always sort of protective and um just not doing that but I, I heard you know something like this a while back and I was like I want to try this out it was so funny because like I was leaving my old studio downtown and it was kind of uh yeah it was just like I think during the day I was going out on my lunch to just go get some food and mm. I like walk outside and the first person I see outside like I just like smiled at and like just you know gave him a big grin and tried to be nice and then he he yells back at me like he's, he says like who the fuck are you smiling at? Like, fuck you. <laughs> it was just like, that's like, priceless. It was, just, it was so funny. Uh, and I just like had to like, I had to laugh, like, just like, wow. <laughs> like that's how far, that's how far, like how like strange this, was. you know, that same idea of it's like, whatever you're giving out gets reflected back at you. The old programming that yes. I had so long, as soon as I try it, it comes back the mentality that I sort of had. So, so how did you respond? <laughs> I mean, it was like, wow. I mean, at first I was like, wow, that's, a, that's really testing me. I get, I don't know. Like, I can't remember how, like how, what my real, it, but it didn't, it didn't stop me. Like I was like, right. okay, that was my first try. And wow, it's really testing me to see if I could really do this. So I, I went out and I started doing it again. And then every other time that never happened again, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like I, I attach. So you know, in, in my career and working with kids, I would create, um, you know, a great way for, especially for young people who, who have never necessarily worked with children or adults. We had this acronym that was, it was Westie. It was some, I heard, I heard somebody else who was phenomenal with kids talk about, it was like, uh, go West. And it was an acronym for meeting someone for the very first time. But, um, you know, Westie was um, an acronym for, you know, when you first meet a parent and a child, you know, welcome them, make eye contact, smile, um, tell them something about, tell them something about them. So like something like, I really like those pink shoes. They're pink's my favorite color. And then, so, and then tell them something about yourself. So I love those pink shoes. Pink is my favorite color. And especially for kids, it's really disarming. Um, mm -hmm. And then I is introduce them to somebody else. And so if you have somebody else there, if there's a new parent or another child, you know, Jeremy, come on in. I have to introduce you to someone else in our class. His name is Jacob and you guys can be friends. But this, this way of greeting people, um, because I would train young coaches um, on how to connect and make a meaningful connection with someone for the very first time to make everyone comfortable. Um, I, I kind of ingrained it in my, you know, it's, it, you got to practice what you preach. And so when I meet people, I, I tend to do this now subconsciously. I just, I'm, my, my kids are like, do you know everybody? Because you say hi to everyone. And, um, but I think it's really disarming. Uh, I always say that the smi a smile is the most disarming um, exchange or interaction that you can have. It lets somebody know that you're safe. You're a safe person to be around. You got to be careful because there's certain kinds of smiles where people can read that as being something different. But if there's a genuine smile, like you, like you said, it comes from who you're from your heart, and it's uh, I'm genuinely happy to see you. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's wonderful. So I usually pair it with someone. So I'll smile, and especially if it's a guy, 
Um, because I think males sometimes have that, like, like this guy, it's like, fuck yeah. you. Um, he, he's not used to having another man just stare at him for no reason. And usually it's like, yeah. are, you look, are you making fun of me? Is there something funny? Um, but what I usually do is like, I'll smile and say, Hey man, how you doing brother? And it's almost like that, that connection where it's like, Oh, this guy is smiling, but he's, he's not doing it in a weird way. He's just trying to say hello and connect. And so, and I've seen people go like this first and then, Hey, how you doing brother? Nice to see you, man. He's out. Oh, uh, good to see you. And it's almost like I'm already past him. He's like, oh, but wait, I want to say hi. Like you, you right. just see that reaction right away. Um, but anyways, uh, I no, just I like, love, that. I love that. I like, yeah. yeah, I like that. Having that game plan too, like going in and really being able. I mean, it's just about like making deeper connections with people and, and having that. Um, so yeah, like I, I think well, you sort of jogged in my mind, like my, my real feeling. I was like, man, it's... It, 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 I, I, what the thing that came to my mind after sort of being a little offended was, um, man, I bet that we just must be having like a real shit day, you know, like to, to yeah. respond to somebody in that way. And I yeah. just kind of felt bad for him and just, you know, um, we all could, we all could like be in that state of mind. If you just, whatever was just going on and then you just some, saw some guy walking around smiling. You'd be yeah. Angry, and maybe it's not just a shitty day. Maybe it's a shitty life. Like maybe, mm-hmm that's yeah. that's the in that soup yeah he just that's the soup he's swimming in and you know it's going to take a lot of smiles and a lot of hey how you doing man and yeah you know, whether we can we can help you know so we yeah I like, I like your acronym too and the, that game plan of just like really like um just not walking in cold and and just like having a having a plan like that it, it at first it feels like when i started doing things like that it, it felt like i was like cheating or i was like doing yeah something like too rehearsed like, yeah like you're doing like yeah like you're doing something shady or whatever but it's like no like my intentions are to like make that person feel good and yeah and and what you brought up was that exactly what narayan was talking about in this talk he said you know when you're walking around with swami kriyananda he would he would point out he's like oh i love that scarf it's such a beautiful color and and they would light up like you know it's like go around lighting people up like saying yeah. nice things and that that's something that i really want to get better at of just when you think of something and also too like we'll talk about this a little more in the, the talk here but every time you think a, a pleasant thought about some every time you have a kind thought about someone you awaken the kundalini the energy within your body that gets stuck in the chakras uh, with your karma and all these kind of things what we're doing in, in yoga and meditation, especially Kriya yoga is learning to awaken the life force energy in the body and move it upwards. That really just bypasses all of our karma. But every time you even think a kind thought or say something kind to somebody, you're moving that energy in your body. So yeah. it's a, it doesn't even have to be completely uh, you're doing it for them. You're doing it for yourself. As That's well. right. So That's exactly good, right. You know, so, so the next thing he said, um, he said M is for music, but he said, but I'm not talking about the songs that we sing or the chants that we chant. He was saying that the real chanting is the vibration of our own being. And he said that anytime that we are with anyone, we can share that vibration. We don't even need to say anything. And then he referenced the disciple of of um of yogananda he said the quote from him was no matter where you are whatever position you are in life you can just silently radiate love and joy and you don't have to make a big production out of it so it's this idea that if we are in, say, say you're, you make a daily practice of this joy affirmation and you're tuning in with the visualizations and you're, and you're actually starting to feel that joy, and you can just go and sit with somebody and radiate that joy, share it with other people without even saying anything to them or making a big production about it. Or, you know, you just, you, if you're vibrating in harmony, you're feeling comfortable and content like others can feel that or if you're agitated and not doing that you're you're sharing your vibration any anyway so this is a practice of a way that you can just go around people feel good just being around you you know so i think that's really cool yeah i love Um, that yeah not making a big deal out of it you know like i think i think when this gets all like 
when people take offense to like talking about being happy all the time, you think of just sort of somebody, some annoying charlatan pretending to be happy. But this, this happiness, it comes like, I know the happiness that I have and that I can go around uh, emanating from time to time came through a lot of difficult things and tragedy and keeping, um, keeping the practice going, even in the face of, of really difficult things. So when you, when you're doing that and then you go and then you actually smile at so when I smile at someone now, I, I know that they can feel that's not like a fake smile that I'm giving them, you know? <laughs> and so we just get more in tune with our own being and that true nature of us is that like high frequency happiness vibration of contentment we could just share you know without even saying anything and so yeah. in the next um, line here uh this is that what i shared before he said swami kriyananda's description of love is bliss in motion so it's really helpful, I think, because we can feel that that joy. We can we can, you know, tune into feeling a sense of joy. We can imagine doing something that we really enjoy doing and tune into that feeling. And bliss in motion. So imagine, you know, imagine feeling that joy within you and then sending it to someone else. That's love. And that's what God is doing. God is feeling bliss all the time and then sending it to you. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, I love that. Like everything that's an act, like just, you know, passive versus active, like uh, love is an action, you know, it, it doesn't just sit. There's something about um, with all things, like there's something about activity. And I think to, to describe bliss and joy in that way um, is, is really important for people to realize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the next, um, the next line that note that I have here, um, Narayan was saying that the three vibrations that Yogananda most emanated were love, joy, and wisdom. He said that we think about these three as separate, but in fact, they are one because the love of God's bliss, because the love, this love, this love feeling is God's bliss in motion. And the wisest thing that we can do is to share that. So this idea of love, joy, and wisdom, they are three, but they are in fact one because the love that exists is God's bliss in motion, which is joy. And then the wisest thing is to share that. So that's true wisdom is going around sharing uh, bliss with everyone. That's the wisdom, joy, bliss as one. That's a good and, one for my, well, for me as an, as a dad um, and as an adult, but for my kids, I think that's, that's wonderful. What a great way to, um, to explain, you know, even like in, in my, in my, um, in my daughter's words, my daughter's world, she would say sharing is caring, you know, mm -hmm. that's what she, that's what she tells herself, but you know, that's the, that's, I guess that's the way a child would define that, you know, um, that love, um, what it's, a, you know, my daughter has a love for everything, but like snacks, something that's really big. And so when she has her goldfish with her and she's walking, um, she reminds people like, you know, she'll ask people if, she, if somebody wants some or what have you, but when she gives it to them, she says, sharing is caring. Um, but she's not saying because, you know, but maybe she is, but like, um, just well i'm a good person for sharing but i think it's just that she wants people to know that sharing is caring like that's the way that she teaches people and so that hopefully they can they can either return the favor to her one day when she, you know they have goldfish and she wants them or you know when they're with somebody else they can remember that but yeah that's yeah. Interesting. yeah yeah that's cool and let's see so the next the next point here oh this is what i kind of touched on earlier um this is this is from a talk from earlier that Narayan was was mentioning that uh, Naya Swami or uh, Ramachari Sagar was talking about. He said the most important thing to awakening the Kundalini, which we talked about, is the life force energy in the body. This is what um, all great yoga and meditation practices uh, for self realization are to awaken the Kundalini, the the blocked energy that gets coiled up within us, and to move that energy up the 
through the chakras up the astral spine to the spiritual eye and then eventually up the, the crown chakra when you fully become a fully realized master. And he said that the most important thing to awakening the Kundalini is kindness, generosity of heart and truthfulness. So these techniques that we have, if we practice them alone, they, they are null and void. They're, they're, they're rendered null and void without marrying them with kindness, generosity of heart, and truthfulness. So right living, you know, we have to have this, this right way of living as well. And every time we think about a kind thought about someone, every time we do something good for someone, every time we're truthful and honest and generous, and we're awakening that kundalini in us. And that's actually the most important thing you do. And you measure, you marry that together with the, with the uh, meditation techniques, the scientific techniques that will also unlock the energy that gets caught in, in the chakras. The chakras are different energy centers in the body. And that's a whole other uh, conversation, but all of our karmas and past, all of our experience, all of our things that we've done in our lives create these blocked energy centers in, in, our, in our body. But when we, start to, uh, when we start to act in a kind way, think kind things about people, we're generous and we're truthful, that actually moves that energy up through, through our body. So that's a really practical, wonderful reason to be doing that. <laughs> And so the next one, he has eye for the eye and smile is for inspiration. And this one is a, is a little bit abstract here, but in inspiration, he says that um, Yogananda said, when this eye shall die, then shall I know who am I? So what I get from that is that this eye, this eye, I'm always thinking about myself. I'm always like looking out for me and always focusing on what I can get out of it and wondering if there's enough left for me. But if we switch that to, you know, we just let that eye die and then we always focus on others and um, care more about others' happiness than our own. The more we do that over and over, then I, then I'll know who I'm, then shall I know who am I? Because we get so attached to this, this body, this, this mind, these senses, and, and I, 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 but we're really not this, but we're just renting this body and this personality for a short period of time. What we truly are is, is not this. You know, cut off your arm and throw it in the trash. Are you, are you your arm? You, you know, you keep cutting things off. Are you that? Are you that? Are you that? You just, I always think of like, you know, like Robocop, you just got his whole body exploded and he's just like, they, they show him just like a head that, you know, there. And it's like, are you that? Are you just the head? You know, what are you? This, this whole time, it's like, we just think that we're this body, but really we're infinite, we're eternal. So the more often we can focus on others, then we can allow this I, saying I and me, mine, worrying about myself. We actually, if we stop doing that, our life would be a lot less stressful if we stopped always worrying about what's, what we're, what's coming to us and what's good for us and just focus on uh, other people and then you'll really discover who you really are. What? Yes. And, and I was talking with my brother-in-law about this actually, uh, because I think, I feel like we, we were touching on this when we talked about the psychedelic experience and um, about, you know, sometimes when we're, we're going through something painful in our life, um, it's really easy to be, you know, jaded by that. Like, woe is me. Why do I have to experience this? And um, sometimes when you go through these really rough times, you know, you say to yourself, oh, maybe there's a lesson to learn. And for a lot of people, they're like, no, it was just painful as hell losing my kid or, or losing my job or, or losing a limb. Like there's and and I can force myself to learn something for it. But if I could press a button and go back and change it so I could have my whatever that life was, a lot of people would say, I'd press it in a heartbeat so I can see my child again, or I could have that job again, or I could have that limb again. Um, and so I think when you look at it as an individual, I think that it can be very isolating and you can get stuck. 
I think when you start to see it as maybe this experience happened to you so you can, so because it's actually for somebody else, meaning, um, you know, so for example, for me, my, uh, losing my grandmother, she was the closest person to me in my life. I've never loved any human being as much as she. And um, if I could, if I could say, you know, all the good things in my life, you know, she'd be responsible for 90, all the good things about, about me as a human being, she's responsible for 90% of those, you know, that's how I feel. Um, she caught me at all of my teachable moments. And I lost her first, first love that I've ever lost. And, oh, man, did it hurt. You know, I remember when she was on her deathbed, she had, you know, cancer had riddled her and they were about to move her to palliative care. And I broke down and I'm crying and I put my head on her chest and I'm crying. And I had broken up with a girl recently and my grandmother knew it. And she says to him, I'm crying on her chest because I know she's passing away. I wasn't crying about this girl, but she says to me, you know, Jay, I don't like to see you crying like this over anybody that any girl. And I said, Nana, I said, I'm not crying over a girl. I'm crying because I'm losing you. And even though cancer had riddled her and she had, she, she was going to point in her life where she was starting to have hallucinations, where she would hear children singing to her, or she would see like a relative, but you know, this is just before she passed on. I know this is something that a lot of people have these kinds of experiences before they pass, but she has this incredible moment of clarity. And she says to me, catching me right at a teachable moment again, right before she passed, mm -hmm. she says to me, she says, baby, you have to go through this. You have to go through losing me like this because wow. it, is, it is the only way you will ever be able to relate to someone else who loses someone they love. Damn. And I, that's cool. Unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Wow. You know, yeah. and, and I carry that message with me for the rest of my life. And so going back to your point, Chris, I think sometimes we go through things, not just for ourselves, we go through so we can relate to somebody else. And in fact, that is the way out of hell when we connect with somebody else and we pass mm -hmm. this baton, this lesson that we've learned in life and we help somebody else's path. That's actually what helps me reconcile my, losing my grandmother because yeah. I was able to take that experience now and make something, make life easier, that much easier for somebody else. So anyways, this yeah, just goes really to great. support your point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, and, um, yeah, having, yeah, yeah, that's great. That's a great one. I have a lot of things to, to, to follow up on that. But yeah, I really, I really, um, it's amazing that she was able to continue teaching you in that moment and to give you that little nugget. I mean, it's probably hard to, hard to even stomach hearing that then, but um, yeah, much how valuable it, it was probably afterwards when you were immensely you know, yeah. assessing it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in that same vein, um, for the eye for inspiration and talking about when this eye shall die, then I shall know who am I. Uh, he, he read from, he was saying also the, um, you know, he was reading from this book, which is um, an amazing collection of Yogananda's uh, words from a lot of different writings that he did and saying, this is, called, this is called How to Be Happy All the Time. <laughs> oh, I need that book. Yeah. Um, so this is um, this is a section about avoiding the happiness thieves. So the thieves that would rob us of our happiness. Mm. And one of the, the the big things that he talks about here, he says, your individual happiness depends to a large extent upon protecting yourself and your family from the evil results of gossiping. See no evil. Speak no evil, hear no evil, think no evil, feel no evil. People can talk about other people for hours and thrive under the influence of gossip, like the temporary influence of intoxicating poisonous wine. Isn't it strange that people can so smoothly, joyously, and with causic criticism talk about the faults of others for hours? but cannot endure a reference to their own faults at all. And so Love that. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. So these are the things that rob us of our happiness. So if we're, we're trying to make a practice of this and then you catch yourself talking negatively about somebody, like 
it takes a while to stop to put on the brakes. Like I know it's like, as I do it, like I'll, I'll start, you know, complaining about somebody like, no, 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 it's not, it's no, this is going to rob me of my happiness. Or yeah. if other people are doing it, like don't join in just, you know, it, it, it's going to steal your own happiness. It's going to hurt your, your own. You're going to, if you're judging other people, you're going to judge yourself harder, mm. you know? Yeah. So if we stop doing that, it's going to stop robbing us of our happiness. It's just, and this idea, like, see no evil, hear no evil, feel no evil, think no evil. Just don't go around looking for evil and pointing yeah. out evil all the time. Yeah, yeah. You'll keep <laughs> finding it, like you said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's always there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's just, it's just like a, yeah, intoxicating, poisonous wine, he calls it. It's, it's like, yeah, it feels good when you're like, you know, sort of like, yes you know get you know talking shit about somebody and all that you know makes you feel like you're you're a better person but it's like yeah maybe they have um difficulties with something that comes easy for you and then maybe they're really good at something that you have a lot of difficulties and they're probably if you're talking bad about them they're probably talking bad about you about yeah their fault. so just don't do that and people won't do it about you so much i'm sure yeah that's a good point <laughs> Yeah. So then the L, L in smile, he says, um, is for laughter. And this is really cool. This is, this is a song. This is song lyrics by Swami Kriyananda that go, the secret of laughter lies in the laughing, not in the search for joy. <laughs> oh, I like <laughs> that. That one's thinking a little bit. <laughs> You know, one more time, read it one more time. Yeah. The secret of laughter lies in the laughing, not in the search for joy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's like, good. Lies in the laughing, like in that moment of that laughing, moment. in that joy, you know, and that kind of like Naya Swami um, uh, Narayan was saying, like, this kind of at first I didn't quite like was like really is that true like because we spend we're on this quest for for joy we're, we're we're seeking joy we're doing all these practices to feel joy like it's so it's it's the secret is not the quest for joy it's lies in the laughing yeah so it's like a really cool little little switch to like give us this teaching about what um what real joy really is the yeah. secret of laughter <laughs> yeah it's, I like it's that a lot laughter in the moment it's like a present moment thing i think yeah and i think you know we're always always trying to get somewhere just to stop and you know and and those kinds of like i think i don't know if you you have those of course you have those like laughing spells where somebody you connect with another human being up whether or like you had an experience together or you had like something was so funny and then you can't and your your belly hurts sometimes you have to like get up and run and leave the room and i've had you know and i've had those experiences in my life um many many times thankfully because i have a lot of really good friends that have been my friends since i was a kid and then we have these like certain experiences that we share with one another that we had these laughing spells and it hurts so much but the joy the extreme joy you have in that moment oh my goodness it's it's better than any it's better that you can't you can't like it's impossible to just replicate and the what other part is and i feel like this might be why they say like it's in the laughter not in the seeking of joy is because there's there's you can't you can't seek it you like you can't predict you can create as many experiences as possible but you know it's it's few and far between those those moments of laughter you're like oh my god that was a good one it happened five years ago but like we laughed for an hour um I think if you seek it, you can maybe spend the rest of your life seeking it. And then mm -hmm. that moment hits you and you miss it. So I think mm -hmm. that's why that moment is so important. Mm -hmm. And you have to allow yourself to feel it. You know? True. Like so you, true. You have to go in like going like, I'm ready to laugh, you know, tonight or yeah. whatever. If you went in all mopey, and there's no, no, no amount of like funny things somebody says is going to like make you laugh, you know, if you right. in grouchy. So it's like, so yeah, I like just allow myself to feel joyful and free, yeah. you know, to laugh. Uh, so the, the, the E and smile, the last one here, he says is for eternity. Mm -hmm. And he's referencing here. There's uh, you know, like the truth is that we are eternal, 
And that is like, you know, the truth, uh, Satchitananda, uh, ever conscious, ever existing, ever new bliss is what we truly are. And that is infinite and eternal. And he said also, it's a, he's referencing this book, Whispers from Eternity, which is, uh, I, in my opinion, the most fascinating book uh, ever written. This is, wow. um, this is Yogananda said, when I'm gone, read from my whispers from eternity and I will speak to you through them. So this is a way like, if you wanna connect with Yogananda, which who, the way that I see him is he's, you know, he's not a, it's not a person, but a, um, he's just a completely um, clear transmission of, of the divine of God mm. coming through a, a person who left us with these books that, and also, like in, in my practice, since I'm a disciple of Yogananda, like I, I can, when I have questions, when I when I want to, you know, know something, I, I can I can call to mind the things that I'm asking about, and I can turn to books like this, and you know, flip to a, any page, and then all of a sudden, like he's just speaking to me as if you were in the room, kind of an oh, idea. Wow. That's what he says this book is for and um, and their prayers like this is a book of, you know, this is this is the he called, this is where he has this sacred demands to the infinite. So oh, when right. you talk to God, this is how he talked to God. And this is a way that you could also talk to God in the way that uh, God most enjoys his uh, children coming to him, not as beggars. And yeah, is there a, is there a quote in there that stands out for you that you can maybe share really quickly? Yeah, so the one that the one that um, Narayan was was sharing here, and there's there's a ton of them in here, but this was this was the the one that he shared, and this was about um, this is called the Universal Prayer in the Cosmic Temple, and this is this is about you know just this this universal longing that we all have, and that everyone who is seeking. God is seeking eternal, ever new bliss. Mm -hmm. And that no matter what religion, no matter how far off you are, really, like even if you're, you know, seeking it in the wrong ways, everybody who is striving is all seeking the same thing and that all humans eventually will get there. And that it's, 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 all, it's all God interacting with God. So he says in this, this is Yogananda, he says, with a myriad of living thoughts of devotion, I have built for thee a temple of awakened silence. I have brought the multicolored lamps of wisdom from all valid faiths. They shine with the luster of thy one truth. Commingled incense of human craving for thy love soars up in spirals from the incense bowl of our hearts. The sacred presence shines on all altars everywhere. All prayers of all temples, tabernacles, churches, mosques, and viharas are chanting to thee in the universal language of deep love. The orchestra of our combined feelings plays in harmony with the chorus of all soul songs, with the cry of all tears, with the bursting shout of all joys, and with the united anthem of all prayers. In this wallless cosmic temple of the soul, we worship thee, our one Father. Be pleased to reveal thyself to us always. Amen. Om. Amen. Mm. Mm. I was thinking the other day, it's, it's like how it's sort of, uh, it's comforting to think about, like I, I've been working on this practice of what's called Japa, where you take a mantra, which for me is, is uh, Ram, 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 or Rama, and just repeating, repeating that all day, I really uh, tune into it like during painting or when I'm making artwork, if I can if I can keep that chant, that mantra going, then like it's a, it's that, that moment of a quiet mind and open heart and just tuning into um, just saying the name of God over and over. And man, I can pull so much straighter, more beautiful lines. That wow. Really? We'll see them that you can feel it. And it looks, you know, it just looks so much more beautiful. Even if I feel like I'm going off, but I keep the mantra going and I keep my mind clear. Like it just ends up being 
beautiful like it's it's really cool so it's it's one of the most wonderful things to do and it was coming to me as a, a really like a, a blessing thinking on along these lines of imagining all of the other people who are also because that's an ancient and very um powerful mantra that many many i don't know how many other millions of people are all currently right now in their mind going wrong 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 right and tuning into that same primal force of all creation and you can use that while you're working out or when you're with your partner or when you're you know working on something like you can use that to focus yourself and 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 have a more blissful experience mm -hmm. yeah, yeah and it takes it away from your you know your anxiety or your self-consciousness or thinking about oh uh, you know i'm not I'm, you know, I'm not that great of a painter there's so many others that are better than me or like anything mm -hmm. that you're doing if you're tuning into the the force of all creation that created the stars the universes the planets like oh surely you could make a beautiful painting through right mm -hmm. That's cool. And then it becomes less about I, you know, and that I will die, that I dies when you tune into that. So yeah, that that's the end there of the of the um the notes that I have for for that course. But this is really just all about, yeah, like a feeling tuning into to bliss and to joy. And then um I'll follow up this this episode. I'll record a like a under 30 minutes of a, a practice that you could do in the mornings or in the evenings or in the afternoon, whatever makes sense. And then I would put out a challenge to everybody to do this for a week. And then next week we'll, we'll get together again and um, talk about how it went. And you can, uh, for the listeners can, can join our discord uh, server and jump on there and like have conversations with us and with each other. And like, we'll make this a real challenge together. And the more that you do it, you really, you become the, the programmer of your mind. So just imagine for all of these years, it's been doing something else and it, your brain is just always going, well, he, he's been sad and miserable when times get tough. So he always wants to be like that. Right. It's going to take a little time, but just keep doing it and keep doing it. And what you're, what you're doing is really healing your mind and you can have moments of just feeling joy and feeling bliss. Like, even if you get like just small moments of that, the, the effect of that is, is, is beyond anything you can imagine. It's yeah. like really great. Yeah. Well, that was amazing, Chris. Thank you so much for taking us there. And hopefully we'll all be able to experience bliss uh, and joy after this podcast and giving ourselves permission to disconnect from the world and meditate and find that quiet space. Cool. Yeah, man. Thank yeah. you. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. And thanks for everybody for thanks to everybody for listening. I mean, this is this is what I want to do most, of, you know, most most in, in life and with the, the work that we're doing and putting these things out is just really giving people permission to be happy, you know, even yeah. when it's grim and dark out there. We need to do this. Like Ananda, we, we talk about being warriors of light, that we came to earth during this time to emanate light for those that in need and to make this planet better so i was thinking another fun thing that we could do there's like a oh, during the pandemic when it was like the, during the deep lockdowns every week every thursday at ananda we had a we we did this mantra it was a warrior of light where it was like an affirmation that i am a warrior of light and sending this this light vibration out and vis visualizing the the healing the planet the planet healing itself and we were doing that together it might be fun to maybe through twitter or something maybe once a yeah what, um, what are your thoughts on uh, scheduling our next ama to share some of this with those of us who maybe not haven't had a chance to, to listen to the podcast or uh, want to have an experience with you live to go through some of this yeah i think that would be a cool way to do it we can like talk about these things give a practice out yeah. there and connect on the ama all right so um Let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll end the podcast and then you and I can maybe establish some dates for the next AMA. And maybe there's an AMA that we can do within the discord because now I think we're just about 400 members now, which is really exciting. Um, you know, so we can have one a an AMA in the discord and we can do an AMA on Twitter as well, but we can, mm -hmm. we can. Yeah. Yeah. And follow the, follow the Twitter, the seekers of the eternal Twitter and 
Also, that one is um, at Pale Horse Design on the for the Twitter. That's right. And then the Instagram. Um, there's links to all of all of the, the things that we're doing on my Instagram profile, which is just at Pale Horse. And so, yeah, and and that will take you to the Discord channel, the the Seekers of the Eternal um, uh, page that has all the details about what we're doing with the NFT collection. Yep. And, and all of that so and all of the episodes of this now on youtube as well and spotify and and apple and a few others so it's, a, it's all getting out there now more and more it's been an amazing journey and i just can't wait to continue it with you yeah it's been super fun yeah it's super fun to share this stuff and uh, it's yeah, helping me out a lot so thanks everybody for tuning in yeah thanks so much everyone uh, that wraps up another episode of Seekers of the Eternal with Pale Horse and Jason DeRosha, and we will see you again soon. Cool. See ya. All right.